I wonder, are you finished shopping yet? I hope so. Uh, the person next to you hopes so as well. Because let's be honest, Christmas really is about the gifts. I mean, the parties, I could do without. And the food, not so much. That, uh, that crazy uncle, we could, we could leave him to one side. Because I, I, I don't care what Charlie Brown says. Christmas really is about the gifts. The children know this. In his book, The Pastor as Minor Poet, Craig Barnes writes, I've never had a child come to me to talk about the stress of the holidays. They aren't worried about making it to all the parties, buying the perfect presents, maxing out their credit cards and travel plans. As every child knows, the only stress of Christmas is how we can possibly wait for it to arrive, the day when we receive so much. So what are you hoping for this year? Well, I bet I know what you were probably not hoping for. You were not hoping to wake up on December 5th to unbreathable air. You were not hoping to wake up on December 8th to raining ash. You were not hoping for one sleepless night after another as the fire grew closer to home and emergency alerts grew in frequency. You were not hoping for canceled classes, shut down businesses, or days of entertaining energetic children who were trapped inside homes that had somehow become maximum security prisons. <laughs> and even then, you were not hoping to have to evacuate your home or to drain your savings on hotel and restaurant bills. You were not hoping to trade in national lampoons for K-E-T-Y or Clark Griswold for John Palminteri. <laughs> and no one was hoping to lose their home, as happened to not one, but two of my students. No one was hoping to lose their home for Christmas. I mean, bad things, they're not supposed to happen at Christmas, are they? I mean, Christmas is supposed to be that time when the police stop writing tickets and when the creditors take a day, and when your boss doesn't task you with an urgent assignment, unless, of course, you work for a church. <laughs> and if anyone was going to observe the sacred season, you would think that it would be above anyone else, God, right? You would think that God wouldn't let thing, bad things happen on Christmas, but he does. It's been that way from the outset when Mary and Joseph know what it's like to have to evacuate their homes due to unrest at Christmas. We associate ease with God's favor and difficulty with his opposition. Surely God's plan would not involve an uncomfortable journey in Mary's ninth month. If God were for her, at least he could expect, or she could expect a decent room to deliver her baby in. Could he possibly care about them and allow for that? Why did God do this? Does he not care about them? It's an important question. It's the question. Can I believe God is for me? Can I believe that God is for me given my life and all its messy detail? In Romans 8.31, the Apostle Paul writes, If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, Paul knows that if you only knew that God was for you, then things would be okay. If we could only know that God was for us, that he was absolutely for us, well, then we could face what came our way. We could have joy in the midst of suffering, confidence in the midst of adversity, peace in the storms of chaos. We could rest and breathe easy in the midst of fire. 
If only we knew that God was for us. And if God was for us, how could we even tell? Well, Paul goes on in the next verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He who did not spare his own son. And it's worth thinking for a moment of what the son was not spared of. He was not spared. He was not spared the constraint of skin. And the word became flesh, writes John. He was not spared the trauma of the birth canal. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, Luke tells us. He was not spared the shiver of inadequate shelter. She wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Our God contracted to a span and comprehensively made man. He was not spared a refugee's household as he was hunted and the innocents around him were slaughtered. He was not spared a dissuading family, the weathering of manual labor, or the instability of homelessness. He was not spared physical exhaustion, hunger, thirst. He was not spared the grief of losing his best friend or being disowned by another. He was not spared isolation, loneliness, or even unfulfilled sexual desire. He was not spared the heartbreak of betrayal, the injustice of a rigged court, the defamation of human spittle. He was not spared. He was not spared loud cries and tears, sleepless nights, unanswered prayers, pleading, Father, remove this cup from me. He was not spared. He was not spared terror, torture, abuse. He was not spared the agony of the nails, the vulnerability of nakedness, or the shame of the cross. He was not spared. He was not spared the weight of God's gavel, the guilty verdict, the sentence of death. He was not spared the first death, the termination of physical life, the loss of embodied reality. He was not spared the second death, the loss of spiritual life and the awful weight of sin, the infliction of the wrath and curse of God. He was not spared. He was not spared that you and I might be spared. Spared the penal properties of sin. Spared the second death. Spared eternal disembodied destruction. Spared God-forsaken rejection. Spared. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. In a sermon on December 25th, 1540, one of the most famous Christmas homilies was preached by an aberrant monk. The sermon is Martin Luther's sustained meditation on two little words that appear over and over again in the birth narratives of Jesus. The words, for you. Luke 2.11, for unto you, to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Luther explains how Christmas is not merely news about Jesus' birth, but news about Jesus' birth for you. Christmas is not that Jesus was given, but that Jesus was given for you. And it's only when you believe that that it becomes good news. Luther writes, this is the principal thing and the principal treasure in every gospel. Christ must, above all things, become our own and we become his. This is what is meant by Isaiah 9, 6. And unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. To you is born and given this child. Of what benefit would it be to me if Christ had been born a thousand times 
And it would be daily be sung into my ears in a most lovely manner if I were never to hear that he was born for me and was to be my very own. How do you get from sentimental feelings about Christmas to enraptured reverence before the Christ? How do you go from letting your circumstances dictate how you see God to letting God dictate how you see your circumstances? Well, you have to embrace these two words for you. You have to come to embrace that he was not just given, but he was given for you. He who did not spare his only son, but gratuitously gave him up for us all. See, Jesus is God's greatest gift. Jesus is God's greatest gift, not simply because Jesus is the greatest gift God does give in reality but because Jesus is the greatest gift God could possibly give. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the image of the invisible God who holds preeminence over all creation. Jesus is the one by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. And so in Jesus' life, and his life that was the light of men, Jesus is the first and the last, the living one who holds the keys of death and Hades, that place of death. Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And Jesus is the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And he has freed us by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. And Jesus is the one who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory and with great joy, with great joy. He's the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. He is the only God and he is our Savior and he was not spared. God's Maker was made man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the fountain be suspended on wood, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded that life might die. Augustine of Hippo. He was not spared. That you and I might be spared. See, God has given his greatest gift, the greatest gift he could possibly give. And when you realize that, then you know without a shadow of a doubt that he is withholding no good thing from you. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. How will he not with him also freely give us all things? So you see, Christmas really is all about gifts, Charlie Brown. The gift of God, the gifts of God, and the gift of Jesus Christ. Will you receive that gift today for you? Born for you this day, Christ the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.